Good evening and welcome to this very special online event featuring our accomplished friends, Secretary Condoleezza Rice and Philip Zelikow. Before we get underway in this clearly unusual time in the life of our nation and our world, we hope everyone is staying safe. Thank you so much for joining us. Tonight's discussion is hosted by the George and Barbara Bush Foundation and the Scowcroft Institute at the Bush School of Government and Public Service located along with our presidential library at Texas A&M University. My father loved the Bush School, its faculty, and especially its students who share a commitment to service and making a difference. I know from firsthand experience, having taught a course at the school a few years ago, it's an inspiring place. Condi and Philip will be more formally introduced in a moment by our moderator, Elizabeth Cobbs. But we're very grateful to have two respected diplomats of their high caliber and integrity to discuss our world tonight. They each served my dad and brother with distinction and made remarkable contributions to our nation and America's standing in the world. Our moderator, Elizabeth Cobbs, is the Glasscock Professor of History at Texas A&M and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. She's also an award-winning historian and documentary filmmaker and the author of eight books on American history and foreign relations. She comes to us tonight live from her home in San Diego. Elizabeth, thanks for being with us tonight. It's all yours. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I must say, it's really nice to see you. <laughs> it's kind of nice to see anybody, right, in the age of COVID. And last time I saw either of you was at Stanford's Hoover Institution. And Condi is now the incoming director at Hoover Institution. Congratulations on that new appointment. And it's very exciting for the institution. Thank so thank you, Elizabeth, thank you. Yeah, I know, we're really excited about it. And, you know, it's my job to introduce you, but honestly, you know, 1500 people rushed to get on the RSVP list for this event. So I think there isn't anybody <laughs> who doesn't know who you are. Um, obviously the dry facts are, you know, Condi or Condoleezza Rice, uh, Secretary of State um, for George W. Bush, National Security Advisor, Philip Zelikow, a renowned author, um, head of the Executive Director of the 9-11 Commission to uh, investigate that tragedy. Um, so those are the dry facts, but I thought it actually might be kind of fun to start a little differently, uh, which is to say that together today we're going to discuss your book, which if anybody hasn't gotten it, they should immediately get it on Amazon. It's a fantastic book. And um, Together, you've written a book in, at this time, which is neither partisan nor nationalistic, neither partisan nor nationalistic. And this, of course, those are words that so often define our times. And I think, wow, that says so much about you and your collaboration. And you wrote a similar book about 25 years ago and you keep writing together. So my question is, tell us just a little bit about your collaboration, I mean, why, why do you come back to this and why do you come back to each other? You could have written this with other people. Uh, like, are you peas in a pod? Do you finish each other's sentences? So Philip, Condi, tell us about the other. Well, there's a little bit of all of that in it, Elizabeth. Uh, but the first thing to understand is that Philip and I were actually, let me call us policy junior bears together on the uh, National Security Council staff for uh, Brett Scowcroft when uh, we were lucky enough to be there for the ending of the Cold War. And uh, Philip was director for uh, West European studies and uh, for Western Europe, I was uh, for the Soviet Union. And of course, to be there between 1989 and 1991 was to witness these extraordinary events and not just to witness them, but to actually have a chance to participate them in them. So I think one of the reasons that we've wanted to write these books was that we had a chance to be a part of that grand moment at which the dream of Truman and Kennedy and, and Reagan came true, which was that the Europe would again be whole and free and at peace. Uh, communism would essentially be defeated in Europe and it would be done because the United States had kept its focus for 45 years on uh, the fact that free peoples and uh, free markets, but most importantly, free peoples would ultimately triumph. And so we had a chance to 
be a part of that great reckoning. And I think uh, it started our friendship and it, it continues. And, and yes, we can finish each other's sentences. Too. <laughs> yes, we can. Um, back then, Elizabeth, uh, we were, we were uh, scholars and as Condi puts it, uh, uh, junior policy wannabes, I guess. Uh, did you call it junior policy bears? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or policy bear cubs, perhaps. Uh, it could be bigger than cubs. But um, we, we did it as scholars. And actually, the, the original book, we wanted to try to explain just what had happened with German unification, especially. And one of the unusual things we did in that book is we didn't just write it as a memoir of the American style. I could read German. Uh, Condi could read Russian. I remember once upon a time, she actually knew a lot <laughs> about that part of the world and occasionally still looks at it. So we wrote it as a truly international history uh, that tried to actually understand all the different participants on Germany. And then uh, 25 years later, we got back together to write this book, not because we wanted to rewrite the older one, but because actually we wanted to widen out the way we looked at this. And we look back on it, we think, man, that was a time when the world went through a great systemic crisis. One whole system, the Cold War system, was coming to an end. And a whole new system needed to be created to take its place. And what motivated us is a generation later, we think that we thought, and we say this in the book, that we think we're drifting toward another great systemic crisis. Of course, that was before the current pandemic. And since we're coming up on another great systemic crisis, we thought it would be really helpful to revisit in a, with a really wide angle lens, how we got through the last one and got through it with remarkable success, ushering in an age of unprecedented peace and prosperity. Um, the first time the world has gone through a crisis of that scale in all of modern history without a catastrophic war. So maybe we could, it was a good time to understand that example and learn from it. Yeah, and I, you know, I loved how you went through it um, in many ways, you know, there's so many issues we could drill down into, and I, I hope we will, you know, who was particularly responsible, you know, what, what were the personalities, what were the leadership styles of these individuals that, you know, made such an incredible difference. But, you know, one of the sort of basic questions that you've kind of touched on right already, which is, you know, what do you think we don't remember? What don't we get? about what was so important back then that we've forgotten in a way that we need to know now. And why is it so important now? Well, what is that systemic crisis, if you will? Well, Philip is uh, a historian and I'm a political scientist and uh, historians are, are much better at recounting events as they happen. Political scientists have a tendency to go back and impose order on something that was actually not very orderly at the time. And I think what we forget about that period when Germany was being reunified uh, was that first of all, there were real dangers that a country with 30,000 nuclear weapons, 5 million men under arms, was not gonna go quietly into the night and watch 40 years of investment uh, in the communist system in Eastern Europe uh, simply go away. And so that had to be managed. And uh, we're here being, uh, being hosted by the, the George H.W. Bush School. And I have to say that uh, you, you mentioned personalities. One of the important things that we need to remember and perhaps is now underappreciated is the degree to which uh, quiet leadership by George H.W. Bush uh, that didn't make himself the center of attention that gave others their pride of place in these great events actually made it possible to manage what could have been a very dangerous confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union on what would be the fate of Germany. We forget that the epicenter of the Cold War was the division of Germany. And here we were overcoming the division of Germany. And I just wanna tell one little story about George H.W. Bush in this regard. Um, so, you think of three big figures in this, Helmut Kohl, the German chancellor, uh, every German chancellor on German Unity Day from 1948 or 49 on would say, and one day Germany will be unified, but nobody believed it. And then all of a sudden Helmut Kohl finds himself in a position to actually unify Germany as the chancellor of Germany. And then you have Mikhail Gorbachev, everything to lose. 
And yet when it comes right down to it, he doesn't use force. Uh, he does essentially peacefully allow uh, the, the Soviet, uh, tremendous Soviet investment in Europe to, to simply go away. And you have George H.W. Bush, and he is the reason that those two were able to do what they were able to do. And I'll just tell you this little story. On the day that the wall fell, uh, we recount this in the book, on the day that the wall fell, <clears throat> we all went to say to President Bush, you have to go to Berlin. You have to go for, for Reagan and for Truman and for Kennedy. And he said, what would I do, dance on the wall? He said, this is a German moment, not an American moment. And many years later, uh, at his funeral, I uh, ran into Chancellor Merkel, who had come to the funeral. And I said, Chancellor, you honor us by your presence here. She said, I had to come. He unified my country. And the Germans flew their flag at half staff when George H.W. Bush died. Why? Because he stepped back. He let it be a German moment. It didn't embarrass the Soviet Union. And we got through this time. So the, the final point that I would make is, uh, in retrospect, things look orderly. People matter in making them come out well. Yeah, that's a tremendous story. And I remember at one point in the book, you talked about how you know upset he'd kind of get that the press wanted you know fireworks and you know bombastic things to happen. It's like that's not diplomacy. That's not getting people to cooperate. Is as he said, dancing on the wall. Well, in fact, one of the things I found about your book that was so remarkable is the really conservative effort that both you and Philip made to sort of remind us all that, that things looked very confusing at the time. You know, afterwards we go, oh, well, of course, you know, this happened and then that happened and we're all trying triumphant, et cetera. Um, but in fact, at that time, we had pinned our hopes on reform in China. And then the acting you know, leader of China was put on house arrest and the old guards sent in the, uh, the troops to Tiananmen Square and Eastern Europe was in meltdown and Chernobyl was literally still hot. There was tremendous anxiety in America about you know, losing our economic edge. There was talk of trade wars, tariff barriers, sounds like now. <laughs> there was all this stuff that was going on. Um, and, yet, uh, and, and yet it's that thing of how do people make choices in that kind of moment. And I love one of my favorite lines from your book is hindsight is not 2020. It is blinding. The path of what happened is so brightly lit that the alternatives are cast more deeply into shadow. I thought that was a wonderful reminder. And I'm wondering if you could just, you know, maybe Philip or Condi tell us well, what could have gone wrong? Like we know how it turned out. How might it not have turned out? at that moment? Well, think back to the situation in, say, mid-1989. The largest mass movement for, we, 1989, famous historic year. The largest mass movement for democracy in the whole world was not in Eastern Europe. The largest mass movement for democracy in the whole world was in China. And in the middle of 1989, it was crushed. And the East Germans watched it get crushed. They called it the Chinese solution. And they almost did it themselves. They were right on the edge of crushing their own revolts just the way the Chinese had. And shrewd diplomacy, including from West Germany and the Soviet Union, made them think maybe there's a peaceful way to get through this crisis. And then a lot of other things began breaking open in unexpected ways. And then you had to try to run for the holes in the line and see if you could do the broken field running to keep, you know, throw a block there, get to the other side of the field, try something else. And uh, in a period of great uncertainty, and this is one of the things that's forgotten, in a period of great uncertainty, like we're living through right now, what they did above all is decide and focus on results. I'll give you an example. Back in 1989, and Condi was part of these debates, a lot of debates thought, will Gorbachev survive? Is Gorbachev actually good for us or bad for us? Is he trying to rehabilitate the bad Soviet Union and make it more dangerous, or is he a genuine reformer? Is he gonna make it or not make it? All those debates. And President Bush and Jim Baker would listen to those debates hour after hour. They got experts in, Condi helped gather them. They listened to the debates and they came out of that saying, you know what, we don't know what the answer is. 
But what we can think about is what is it we want to do? What are the results that we want to drive forward American interests amid uncertainty? We do have concrete objectives about the future of Germany. We do have concrete objectives about the future of the American partnership with Europe in NATO. We do have concrete objectives about an open world economy. We do have concrete objectives about freedom without a violent civil war. How do we achieve those objectives? What coalitions do we need? What partnerships do we need? What policy designs and do we need to engineer to get to those results? So instead of being lost in uncertainty and confusion, instead you start fixing a destination and designing the way to get there. And that's part of what the book tries to demystify, but I think right now that's something that's also being lost, is we're in a time of confusion and uncertainty and one of the ways to get through this is to ask yourself, what are the results you ultimately want as your outcome? And how do you think you get there? And of course, you only can get there through partnerships. One of the other points uh, that I would just un to underscore something Philip said, knowing what you wanted to get done. And then there were certain choices about how you were going to do it. And one of the most important was, are you going to go fast? There were people who believed that uh, we ought to try to slow down the pace of German unification. One of them was Margaret Thatcher. She was terrified at the idea of a, a united Germany. She would reveil President Bush with stories of how the Germans bombed her home and uh, she wanted to slow it down. And in fact, we have some evidence that she actually talked to Gorbachev about slowing the pace of German unification. But George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush was convinced that Germany would not be a danger because Germany was democratic and we could trust the German people. And so he was prepared to let Germany, the West Germans, Helmut Kohl, push the pace as far as hard and as fast as Germany was willing to take it. And that had real consequences because if you do a little bit of a counterfactual, Gorbachev only lasted about a year after Germany was unified. Imagine trying to negotiate the unification of Germany with the Soviet Union collapsing around you with several different republics all claiming a role or go back to August of 1991 and imagine that the coup in the Soviet Union against Gorbachev had actually succeeded. And now you would have lost the window for German unification. So one of the really important decisions that they made was we don't know what Gorbachev's ultimate goals are, but we do know that he seems to be moving in the right direction. That window may not be open very long. We're going to climb through, we're going to dart through that window as quickly as possible. And that was a choice. And it was a choice that turned out to be the right choice. And it was a choice about trust. Right. I mean, I think it's so interesting when I, you know, you think about President George H.W. Bush's own background, you know, shot out of the air as a fighter pilot in World War II, almost died. His two crewmates died. You know, Gorbachev's grandparents having been gotten by the KGB, you know, uh, Shevard Nazi's brother never coming home for the war, Helmut Kohl's brother never coming back from the war. So these were people who kind of knew the stakes. And it's sort of like, what, what is the world you want? You know, we, we've seen the world we, we have had before. Were there some key moments, and I'm thinking of a couple in the book, but I'm curious to what you think about when a different step might have had a different con, uh, con um, you know, consequence, or was there particular steps where you thought, oh, wow, that was the moment. That was that, was that precious moment where we, you know, blocked that or darted through that window. Which ones would you come back to? May I tell a story uh, that I think very few people watching this webinar have ever heard of that uh, is an example of uh, seizing a moment. Um, this is actually a little later in the story. It's in August, September of 1991. Um, the Soviet Union, uh, the coup has been attempted to overthrow Gorbachev, August 1991. Coup fails. But now the Soviet Union is going to break up. Um, the Soviet Union, as Condi mentioned earlier, this is a Soviet Union has 30,000 nuclear weapons. 
scattered all over what will become a dozen different countries. The big, the big missiles in about four of them, but thousands, tens of thousands of what are called non-strategic weapons all over the place and even outside of the Soviet Union. Those, by the way, would be the hardest to corral. So here the Soviet Union is getting ready to break up. Um, Brent Scowcroft actually, um, working with President Bush and also with Dick Cheney, came up with an idea was that we don't have time to write an arms control agreement to corral the tens of thousands of small nuclear weapons that are all over the place. We just don't have time to write a treaty to manage that. So instead, let's invent, and let's invent within like two weeks, an initiative where both sides will simply promise to consolidate and pull back all the non-strategic nuclear warheads they have in the world. And that we're no, no time for a treaty. We're gonna offer to do that. And we're gonna go to Gorbachev and offer to do that and ask him to reciprocate. And then we'll both act immediately on trust. That happened. And because that happened, tens of thousands of nuclear warheads were consolidated and made more secure in a disintegrating Soviet empire. Had they not made those decisions, as Dick Cheney at one point put it, think about if only one-tenth of 1% 1 of those weapons got loose. Incalculable. Then you think, what's the relationship between those two men that made that remarkable agreement possible in the space of really three weeks? And of course, it's partly its trust and, and belief in each other. And this is one of the reasons I want to drive home a, a major lesson. Character matters. Presidential character matters. People say, oh, wasn't George H.W. Bush a nice man, a good man? But they want to say, yeah, but does being nice and good really matter when it comes to really important policy points? Here's a moment in September 1991 where because of that presidential character, and the mutual trust that stemmed from that, tens of thousands of nuclear weapons were corralled and the world maybe was saved from an outbreak of nuclear terrorism that it's hard now for us even to imagine. As I said, a story that very few people are even aware happened, but it's just one more facet of how uh, people coped with uncertainty in a time of crisis. Right, and, and it comes back to character, right? That character is, is terribly important. You know, one of the incidents you focused on in the book that I think exemplifies that, I mean, two leaders, Gorbachev and George H.W. Bush in this case, talking to each other and actually talking to each other was the moment on May 31st, 1990, normally I wouldn't have that date quite so queued up, but I was ready. <laughs> they agreed that as a democracy, a unified Germany was free to choose its own alliances, including NATO. A free, a free democracy was entitled to choose its own alliances. And Gorbachev said, that's right. And everyone in the room sucked in their breath and could not believe that he said that. So tell us, please explain why that's so important. Yes, well, I was there and, and the person, the people that really didn't believe it were the Soviets in the delegation. They were stunned. And it really got set up in a very interesting way because you know sometimes institutions that you don't think matter very much suddenly matter. So back in the early 1970s, something called the um, Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe had been formed. And it was to try to bridge differences between the East and the West. And it had three baskets. One was security policy, one was economic policy, and then there was one called human rights. Nobody thought much about the, why would the Soviet Union sign on to a human rights basket with the rest? Well, because they wanted the economic and security and they didn't think the human rights would matter very much. But one of the principles of the CSCE was actually that countries can choose their own alliances. Nobody ever thought that language would matter. And so what George H.W. Bush actually did, and all of us, uh, Philip and Bob's, uh, uh, Bob Blackwell and, and I kind of constructed the language was that the president would use something that the Russians had already agreed to, to get them to say what we needed them to say. 
And so he said to Gorbachev, now, as we've all agreed under the CSCE principles, countries have the right to, to choose their own alliances. And Gorbachev said, yes, that's right, they do. And uh, the president said, so Germany has the right to, the unified Germany will have the right to choose its own alliance, right? And Gorbachev said, yes, that's, that's right. And uh, someone passed him a note, Bob Blackwell passed him a note that said, say it again. <laughs> and so the president said again, the CSCE says that Germany can choose its own alliances. And Gorbachev said, yes. So that night, um, I was told to call the Russian, the Soviet ambassador and uh, tell him that at the press conference the next day at Camp David, President Bush planned to say that he and Gorbachev had agreed that Germany had the right to choose their own alliance, alliances. And we knew that the, the unified Germany, the FRG led it, <clears throat> would in fact choose NATO. So we called the ambassador and told him this. I didn't sleep a wink expecting that he was going to call and say, no, no, we didn't say that. We didn't say that. Well, didn't get the call. The next day at the press conference at Camp David, President Bush said, and um, President Gorbachev and I have agreed that a unified Germany will choose its own alliances. And Gorbachev said nothing. And that was one of those moments when I thought to myself, this is going to happen. We're going to be able to unify Germany completely and totally on Western terms. But there was one other moment, um, Philip and we've been talking about choices. And it's a choice that Helmut Kohl made that actually he was reviled for by economists and probably still is to a certain degree. Um, there were actually two ways to unify Germany under the German basic constitution. One was, let's call it a merger. East and West Germany come together and they kind of negotiate what they're going to be. The other was, let's call it an acquisition. The FRG would actually acquire each of the five lender, the states of the East German state one by one and East Germany would disappear. Now, of course, from our point of view, if the FRG could simply acquire uh, East Germany, then we, we had it locked because all the decisions would be made by the FRG. If there was some kind of negotiation where it was a sort of merge state, that looked very different. Well, there was gonna be an election in East Germany. And if Helmut Kohl's alliance for Germany won, then Germany would acquire East Germany. How was he gonna get all these East Germans to vote for the alliance for Germany? He said, I will give you a one-for-one -one exchange, your Oistmarks, your currency, for Deutschmarks. The Oistmark by this time is worth nothing. But the East German people are going to get one Oistmark for every, uh, one Deutschmark for each of their worthless Oistmarks. They voted for the Alliance for Germany. And Helmut Kohl won, and we got to uh, acquire East Germany instead of uh, merge with it. And so that was another one of the, and the economist said, you're out of your mind. The Oist mark is, is worthless, but Kohl was making an historic political decision that he had to control how Germany would be unified. Well, you know, one of the, I thought one of the most touching photographs in your book is of Helmut Kohl on the day of unification. And this kind of stodgy, pudgy, oldish man has just a, the most beatific look on his face. You could just see his whole life, you know, that this was the moment that his whole life had been leading up to. You know, it's interesting, these sort of creative choices and creative wording and how that can help people over a hump. But I thought one of the things so interesting to me about that moment where Gorbachev says, yeah, you know, democratic countries can choose their own alliances, is that this has a lot of implications for what's since become a very controversial question, which is, the expansion of NATO. And there are many people who say, well, that, that whole expansion of NATO, that's really what accounts for that that was wrong, that there was a promise made that NATO would not expand eastward. So the question is, expand eastward into what? Into East Germany, into Poland today? You know, what, are, what are the ramifications of Gorbachev having said, yeah, democratic countries get to choose. You know, America won't choose for them. They will choose for themselves. Russia won't choose for them. Their own alliance. So how does that relate to this question and controversy today that has you know, been presented as the reason why we have difficult relations with Russia under Vladimir Putin? Yeah, the, this is a subject of a lot of misunderstanding. 
um, at the when at the time of the conversation Condi is talking about in in May of 1990, this issue was already months in the past, and uh, both sides understood each other's positions extremely well. There was a brief period, actually, in early February of 1990, where there was some confused exchanges on this issue, kind of that went about this way. Um, the German, for, the West German foreign minister had suggested, since the NATO issue is so hard, let's in effect freeze it, because he believed NATO was going to be was going to disappear. He believed NATO was going to be replaced by a whole new security system. So since NATO is going to disappear and be replaced, let's just freeze this NATO issue while we go forward with German unification. That's what folks meant by uh, NATO isn't going to expand to the GDR because we're basically going to freeze NATO in place until we replace it. Um, Jim Baker at first went along with that, not entirely understanding that and focusing on some other things. And then there are some discussions with Gorbachev in Moscow in which they think they're mainly talking about whether or not uh, Germany should be unified and how you're going to manage German military power if it does. And Baker and Genscher and Kohl have all said, well, we're going to freeze this issue for now. And then the Soviets say they don't quite understand this. Let me think about it. In about uh, two weeks after that, this all got clarified. Is Genscher never came up with the plan for replacing NATO. Everyone agreed that NATO is going to be the security system that the Germans want. And actually, all the members of NATO wanted to keep. So then the issue was, is all of Germany going to stay in NATO? And this issue of freezing the old situation went away as an artifact of that earlier conversation. Now, there's that exchange that I've just described to you. There is another issue later is, gee, should NATO expand to like Poland and Hungary and Czechoslovakia? That issue really gets starting, starts to get engaged after the breakup of the Soviet Union after the wars in Yugoslavia, after everyone in Eastern Europe is getting super nervous about security again, in 1992, 93, 94, and it's mostly handled for Poland, uh, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia during the Clinton administration with Boris Yeltsin, which is another dispute that people can argue about. Uh, and in that argument, I'd only say that, you know, in, a lot of Americans who are critical about this really should pay attention to the position of the Germans. The Germans were incredibly sensitive to the views of the Russians and the Poles and the Americans, and also to what the European Union was gonna do in expanding eastward. And at any time, the Germans could veto the expansion of NATO, sensitive to all of these concerns. And so there was very much a cooperative decision with the Germans that NATO ought to go at, at least this far further eastward to provide some stability and reassurance to those countries in Eastern Europe. But that's mostly uh, an argument that, that unfolded later on during the 1990s. Now, let me just uh, add, uh, Philip is absolutely right. The question of whether to expand to Poland, the Czech Republic, that wasn't even on the table in 1990, 1991, because people were expecting either NATO to go away or the Warsaw Pact to remain. Those, those questions weren't on the table. But this has become Vladimir Putin's narrative. And I'm sad to see uh, some in the West basically taking up this narrative. I dealt a lot with Vladimir Putin in the period between 2001 and 2008. This issue didn't come up. This was not a concern for the Russians until it became a narrative of encirclement really having to do more with the color revolutions that took place inside what had been the boundaries of the Soviet Union. So Georgia, Ukraine, uh, et cetera. And all of a sudden, as Putin began to, to write a narrative in his own mind and to, to uh, champion a narrative, that there had been some kind of encirclement. Now it sort of rolls back to, and oh, by the way, there was the expansion of NATO, which you had promised us you wouldn't do. But I can tell you from personal experience that the questions about Poland and other countries being in NATO were simply not, even the Baltic states, they weren't. 
thrilled about it by any means. But the idea that this is somehow responsible for bad relations with the Russians is, is simply a historical. I do think it's fair to say that once we started to promote the democracy agenda and once uh, Russia's neighbors, particularly Ukraine, started to go along and started to talk about the democracy agenda, that really did become a problem in US-Russian relations. Right. And of course, some of that is that goes back to countries make their own choices, right? We're not responsible for every country, a con you know, decision that another country makes. By the way, one of the things I, I also loved about your book, I mean, that you, you titled it to build a better world. And you ended with a quote from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which I loved. It said, he said, I would rather be a builder than a wrecker. Why are you so concerned with building? Because building is a theme of the book. And you mentioned, by the way, the danger of populism. So you do bring this up to the present. And I thought it was, you say, uh, populism is quote, a nice word, unquote, uh, for leaders who more or less claim to represent the national will by attacking the institutions, the buildings, if you will, that constitute the government. And you brought up populism in Germany today, you know, Great Britain, Russia, Italy, and the United States. So why are you critical of wrecking? Um, and how can we build? And also, how do we build in a time of COVID? So um, two reasons. Uh, one is a historian's comment, and the other is a citizen's comment. Here's the historian's comment. Uh, most people think about the period around the end of the 1980s and early 1990s with the phrase, the end of the Cold War. In other words, they think of it as a period of endings, but not as a period of creation. Yet it was very much a period of creation, of creating a different world system to replace the Cold War system. And it's that world system that's now being challenged and questioned and which needs to be updated yet again. So first is the historian's point. We wanted to emphasize acts of creation not just endings. Now, citizen's point. I learned when I was eight years old uh, around a stray baseball that it's easier to break windows than to make windows. It's easier to, uh, to knock buildings down than to build them. We live in a world in which there are a lot of different problems. It's much easier to cause problems than to fix problems. I think one thing Condi and I both share is a real passion for trying to actually fix things, not just break things. Fixing things is really, really hard. Frankly, any adult, once they learn how, what's involved in actually building a house, it feels humbled by the home builder. Uh, building is hard. Constructing positive things is really hard. So take the pandemic crisis we're in right now. Um, it was actually always easier, going to be easier to lock things down than to open things up. It's just, it's just all these super hard issues that we're confronting and all the hard issues about how do you construct a vaccine program? How do you construct a testing program? And so what we wanted to do is to uh, socialize people around problems of building and then the choices you make in how to build. And really, in a way, how interesting those are and how important they are, because we, uh, we kind of really hope people will respect the builders, because um, building is hard and, and we hope folks will uh, help people build things instead of just uh, break things. I, I do think uh, to the point of this creation, uh, there were certain expectations uh, underneath it. Um, obviously, it, there was a strong push for values and democracy. Uh, there was a strong push for openness, for um, more open economies. Um, and one of the things that uh, COVID has done is it has actually accelerated, or if you are saddened by it, exacerbated certain trends that we were seeing before this crisis in uh, the re-emergence of not just nationalism, that isn't necessarily a bad word, but kind of nativism. A kind of, uh, if you look at the way the COVID crisis has un unfolded, and it's probably completely uh, expected, 
people are afraid. So it becomes my borders, my PPE, my citizens, get my citizens home. Too bad if you've got citizens trapped on that cruise liner. I just want to get my citizens out. Why don't you take your citizens back? It is really the revenge of the sovereign state in ways that I think we had assumed uh, you would not see again. And if I contrast that, by the way, to the response of the international system, both to 9-11 and to the uh, financial crisis, those were very much seen as international crises that could not be contained within a border and therefore international cooperation was at the core of resolving them. So just a few weeks after the terrorist attacks in, on 9-11, we got uh, legislation across the world, a resolution in the UN for the tracking of terrorist financing because that was something that crossed borders. We got unparalleled uh, law enforcement and intelligence cooperation because you couldn't contain terrorism within your borders. After the financial crisis, the G20 actually put out a set of principles, uh, including let's not go back to the beggar thy neighbor trading policies that were the cause for the, the one of the causes of the depression uh, in the late 20s and 1930s. None of that, the, the international institutions have basically been sidelined this time around. And one of the questions that I think we're going to face is what do we really think about international cooperation going forward in the preparation of pandemics? And uh, there are preparation for pandemics. And there are really two points I'd like to make. One is scientific cooperation has actually survived. The interesting thing is scientists are working across borders to try to get a vaccine, to try to get therapeutics. But what about early warning? And here, the rise of China, which we sort of deal with a little bit in the book, has turned out to be a real problem. Uh, the integrationist narrative, going back really almost to the time of Nixon, but certainly by the time that the 1989-1990 events were taking place, was, well, China may be a different political system, but we can bring it into the economic system and eventually its system will have to change. Well, we're now learning the down, downside of globalization with an authoritarian regime that doesn't tell the truth. We have an authoritarian regime in China that didn't give warning of what was going on with this, uh, with this virus. In fact, I was national security advisor when SARS hit we had the same problem. We knew something was going on in China. We couldn't get information about who was patient zero. And so it's really going to be a challenge for the international system to rebuild any sense of international trust. It's going to be hard for people to want to break down barriers and borders again. Uh, this is a real blow to uh, globalization and to this, the idea of an integrated international system. Yeah, and I can see that. And one of the things I think that comes out of your book is also that positive things. We've never really, we don't really accomplish things by ourselves in a, in a global world. You know, it's not the United States can do X or Y. It's that only by working together can we solve the really, really hard problems. So it's, it seems like it's always an issue. How do you deal with people, players that don't have that same commitment that you do? And, and you have no choice because they are there and they will be there. <laughs> you know, they've been there throughout history. You know, by the way, we had so many people send in questions. I feel like we should take a few minutes for that uh, uh, to begin with the less perhaps serious ones. Um, AJ Bradfield would like to ask Condoleezza Rice if she's still practicing the piano. Um, and uh, many people are asking if you're gonna run for president and how can they help? So would you like to respond either to the piano or the presidency well, question? Well, the answer to the second question is no. I'm, I'm not a politician, not gonna become one. And the answer to the first question is yes. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the things I've done in this crisis is I practice every day and I finally wrestled to the ground the Chopin F minor ballad. And so I'm very, very pleased with my progress during this period of time. It's given me more time for the piano. All right, very good. You'll, you'll disappoint some people with that answer, but uh, that's just the way life goes. Um, one other person asks that it seems the Cold War just went underground for a decade or so, and we are back to shadow boxing with our old adversaries, whether directly or by proxy. What will it take to move the world beyond the Cold War footing, in either of your opinion? Well, uh, there's a good question as to 
what the what is this supposed new Cold War really about? The old Cold War was about how to organize modern industrial societies, posing um, a world based on freedom versus a world based on communism and dictatorship, a world based on the promises of unfreedom. Um, I'm not really sure that that's the kind of issue that's in play now. I don't think the Chinese model at the moment is looking super persuasive to a lot of people around the world. Um, I, I certainly don't think the Iranian model or the Putin model are looking persuasive at all. But for sure, free societies have a lot of their own problems and other countries are taking advantage of those problems. But this, this feels in a way more like um, our internal failures that create dangerous situations abroad rather than the kind of conflict that the Cold War was about. And uh, that leads to another uh, difference, say, in, as you think about the new struggles today, is go back to that point of what are the results that you want? In other words, um, it's very comforting to just think of China or Russia and strike a culture war pose. I don't like China or I don't like Putin. And let me see if I can yell my anger louder than anybody else. Okay, great, so that's your pose. But what are the results that you actually see with respect to China or Russia? And you can like write down what those results are. Then you ask yourself, how would I actually attain those results? Um, make them up, whatever you like, this stable borders with Russia, um, stable borders with China, a different economic relationship with China. And I think you'll find that the answer to getting those results are going to be coalitions, partnerships, policy designs, things that you build, um, whether it's results you want on climate change or results you want in the South China Sea or results you want in preserving a more open economy which we're gonna to need to work on with the Europeans if, the, if we think the Chinese can't help us. You know, I always remember that one of the uh, statements I remember about diplomacy is that being a di diplomat meeting means eating bad food with good grace. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't get to have good food all the time, yeah, you know, but you, you hang in um, because you don't have a choice. What's the choice? What's the world you, as you said, want? And one of the things that really was clear to me in reading your book is how much George H.W. Bush was that kind of man. It wasn't about indulging what he wanted, making himself look good or whatever. It was like, okay, what's the result we want? So another question, and I think this is something that- Eat your broccoli. <laughs> yeah, another question that's raised by several people is, you know, how do we bridge the partisan divide in our country? What can we do as citizens to help unify our increasingly divided country? And now, Condi, you recently made a film about this with your colleague at Stanford, David Kennedy, called American Creed for PBS. But do you or Philip, do you have anything to say about what citizens can do? The, the first thing that we need to do as citizens is to find our common narrative again. And that's what American Creed was about. You know, we, we're really breaking ourselves into ever smaller groups, each with its own set of grievances, each with its own narrative. It's uh, what did people do to me? Maybe my narrative is superior to yours and my grievances are superior to yours. And, and then it gets reinforced in echo chambers because of the way that we get our, our information these days. Uh, now I can go to my bloggers, my websites, my cable news channels. I actually never encounter anybody who thinks differently than I do. And when I finally do encounter somebody who thinks differently, I think they're either stupid or venal. And so we are reinforcing this sense that uh, it's a zero sum game to be an American. Uh, what I have, I get. If you get it, then I lose. And that was never really the American creed. There was always a sense that it was a growing pie. Now, some of what we have to do as a country and as a society is to actually make it true that it's a growing pie. And it's going to be even more difficult after COVID-19. One of the things that COVID-19 has done is it's exposed some of the real inequalities in our society. 
if you are like us, uh, Elizabeth or Philip, we're working at home, we're doing fine, we're productive, we're on Zoom, we're on our computers. If you have to go to the shop floor or to the restaurant, you're unemployed. That's a basic inequality. We're seeing uh, in education, I'm terrified of what we're gonna find in the education gap. When we have kids who like my mother was a teacher, my, I was actually homeschooled for a year, but my mother was a teacher. She knew how to do that. How about the kid whose parents don't even speak the English language? How much have they lost in this period of time? And so we're gonna have to go back and make sure that that, that common narrative, you can come from humble circumstances and do great things is actually true. But then we're all gonna have to work very hard not to play the grievance game with one another, not to play the zero sum game with one another. And then we're gonna to have to insist that our politicians don't play it either. But I always say when people say, well, they, meaning the leaders in Washington, well, yeah, look in the mirror, America. How many of us are playing that game too and therefore giving our leaders cues that that's the way to get elected? And I'll say just one final thing. Thank God for states and localities. Because even when Washington is, is, uh, is in gridlock, uh, the founding fathers gave us federalism. And I very often find that the states and the localities are doing more for citizens than, uh, than we give them credit for. Now, Elizabeth, uh, I need to uh, insert something here for the record. You and all the listeners heard Dr. Rice explain that she is not a politician. And I'll just say that this is like watching someone who just hit a hole in one and then say, what is this thing you call a golf club? <laughs> I think she's a golfer too, if I recall right. So, uh, <laughs> I, you know, exactly. Uh, you know, when, as I was reading the book, you, you guys built like a, it's like a case study. Like here was a sick patient, patient had been sick for you know, decades. How did the patient get better? You know, what were the mechanisms, the creative things that people did to, to help this happen? And, and so in a sense, I guess, for our president's, present situation, you know, what is the best medicine, you doctors, you? And also, what would George H.W. Bush prescribe? Okay. Don't go quiet on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll dive in. So the best uh, medicine is one that Philip has said a couple of times, what is it you're trying to do? And could you actually for once listen to each other and see where the interests overlap? You know, a lot of negotiation, you know this, a lot of negotiation, a lot of diplomacy is uh, finding, listening, and then suddenly you realize you've got an interest overlap with someone. And I'm now talking about domestic politics, right? Let's internationally, you have to do that as well. And eventually you, as we get our domestic house in order, we are going to be in a better position to lead. But uh, it helps to listen. And one of the problems that we have, if I could do one thing, I would take every politician on both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue off social media, off Twitter, with all due respect to the president, because what does social media encourage you to do? It encourages you to say the first thing that came to your mind, the first thing that came to your head. And then once you've said it, you can't take it back. And now the other person has to attack in the same way. And we've stopped listening to one another. They've stopped listening to one another. And the word uh, that uh, Alexander, or that, um, that uh, James Madison would have said that politics is constant contestation you never want the other guy to completely lose because you're going to need him the next time around. Uh, politics has become a little bit too much of a blood sport. And uh, that the idea that you might actually have something in common with somebody. You know, we've seen in this crisis that we've been able to get some things done. I sure hope that that spirit uh, survives, uh, even if the rhetoric's been pretty nasty. Um, a little bit what you're seeing now is in a way, uh two different definitions of politics here. Um, when, I do, when you do mass politics, mass politics is culture war politics. It's, uh, I try to figure out um, how I identify with the things you hate or with the things you like. 
culturally, those beliefs. I try to stand for the things that I think you like and join you in attacking the things that I think you hate. And sadly, in mass politics, hate, is, hate works better than love, I'm sorry to say. Now, there's another notion of politics, and diplomacy is another one of those words that have a bad reputation, because diplomacy kind of sounds like a bunch of guys in suits schmoozing, and mostly guys. Um, think about politics and diplomacy this way. It's like, this is how you get things done. It turns out that in real life, practically all power is shared. If you want to build a hospital, if Condi, when she was provost of Stanford, you know, wanted to uh, get a road built, um, she couldn't do that by herself. In real life, almost all power is shared. So if you want to get something done, you have to work with other people who have stakes or have a piece of that power in order to get those things done. So there's a world of politics and diplomacy that simply is the world of how to get things done in public life. Now, if you don't care about getting anything done, then all you have to do is strike a pose. But if you do care about getting anything done, and in the midst of a pandemic, I think we should care at least a little, then the advice that Condi just gave a minute ago is the advice people should hear. That's the medicine people need to prescribe. Right, so the message of work together, right? Um, well, at least to some extent. You said that you know anger is more powerful than love, so to speak. Um, you know that is a good question, but maybe it's not. I mean, we have a lot of things, a lot of traditions in world history which say that actually there are powerful things that can draw us together. Powerful beliefs, um, good things can draw people together. Um, it's not just all hate. And one of our uh, re uh, reviewers viewers asked, you know, are we always going to uh, fall into tribalism? And so much of human history has been that, but we has, have also overcome that. I mean, there are people who've looked at the history of the 20th century and said, actually, violence has declined steadily throughout the 20th century and the 21st century, not only between countries, but between families and families. And so there's something at work. And, you know, what do you think is that something that, that maybe is a positive? You know, because actually the loudest Americans are not necessarily the Americans who are actually getting the most done. You know, think about the stories that inspire you every day. Even the frontline workers in this pandemic who are just out there helping people, they're just trying to help people. And my, my belief is actually most Americans are like that. Most Americans want to get things done. They want to get through the day. Most Americans actually have problems in their lives, um, all kinds of problems, um, sicknesses, uh, tragedies. And they're all surrounded in situations where they need help, but often will also give help to other people. They're not mostly being trolls or striking a pose. And in a way, uh, in public life, politics and diplomacy can be like that better side of Americans that we see in our daily lives when they're in the mode of actually trying to get things done. I find when you want to bring people together across party lines, that's most likely to happen when you want to do something. So, okay, let's think about results. Let's think about things we want to, we want to get done. And I think that will bring us together more. I just would add that, uh, and Philip mentioned Americans doing things with each other. You know, in 1835, de Tocqueville came here. He was going to understand these Americans. And one of the things that puzzled him was the so-called voluntary associations, that people just get together to do things that are good. And today we would know them as the American Red Cross or the Boys and Girls Clubs or the Rotary Clubs. And so when we think about democracy and we think about uh, how we're going to, uh, what medicine we need, um, it's also the fact that each and every one of us can, can be a contributor in that way. And um, I, I think we have the great benefit, the great gift of civil society as a part of helping to solve uh, our problems. But I'll just say one other thing. Uh, those of us who believed in kind of globalization or believe in globalization and the integrationist narrative and all of that, you know, we might have also made the whole thing too big. The fact is uh, there's tribalism, but there's also patriotism and nationalism, which are not bad things. Uh, it's not bad for people to love their country. It's not bad for people to want to serve their country. Uh, it's when it turns to nativism that my love for my country has to be my hate for yours that's when we get into trouble. And so uh, if we can find a way to 
find that lane in which we love this country and we want to contribute each and every one of us, but uh, we do it without hating somebody else's. Um, I think that that's really part of the prescription. Right, and that certainly is something that I think George H. W. Bush would have been applauding. <laughs> he would have, and he would, but he would always have remembered Elizabeth again. And this is really important. Free peoples are very, very fortunate peoples indeed, and we still have to stand uh, for those who are not free. Yeah, no, and I, I absolutely agree with you. And I, I think his service from World War II and in, in the United Nations and. You know, and all the branches of American government that he served in, you know, testified to that, you know, his entire life. Um, well, I, I think we're kind of come to the end of our moment here. And on behalf of the George Bush and Barbara, George and Barbara Bush Foundation and the Scowcock Croft Institute, that's part of the Bush School of Government at Texas A&M, I want to thank you both so much for spending this evening with us and thank everyone else for attending. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.